Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders in the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series is going to offer a wealth of knowledge pertinent for all healthcare professionals, as well as the general public. We are very happy to welcome back Dr. David Kahn to our episode to discuss the 2022 Drug Allergy Practice Parameters. Dr. Kahn is a professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, where he has served as the program director for the Allergy Immunology Training Program since 1988. I'm sure all of you are well aware that Dr. Kahn is the current president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and he's also the lead author on these parameters. He is one of the world's leading experts on drug allergy and the perfect person for today's discussion. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for taking time to join us and welcome back to the show. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure as always. Yeah, uh, you, we, we had you on last time to talk about penicillin allergy, and I, I have a feeling we're going to be touching upon that again. Um, but let's start with you know the update to this practice parameter. The last published drug allergy practice parameter was in 2010, and I believe you were also involved in that publication. How is your role different for this new parameter? Yeah, so it was a, quite a bit different. So the last time uh, with the 2010 update, uh, actually our roles were reversed in that, uh, as you know, you were the, the, the task force liaison for the current one, and that was my role back in 2010. Um, it was a little bit different process, and I ended up doing more work kind of on the back end of, of that. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't as long as this process as we'll talk about, I'm sure. Um, but it was, it was still, uh, I, I enjoyed it. And uh, um, yeah, we're looking forward to talking more about the current one as well. Yeah. And as you mentioned, I, I am a member of the Joint Task Force and I was involved as the liaison for this practice parameter. So I, I can attest to how much work you put into this. Uh, and I think it would be really helpful to take our listeners behind the scenes and describe the process involved in putting these parameters together. You know, for instance, when did the work group initially start working on this monumental task and what was the general process to put this together? Yeah. So uh, as, as I was preparing, I guess, for this podcast, I was like, well, let me see exactly when we started this, because I was thinking like, well, it, was, it, was, it wasn't that long ago, was it? Well, it actually was. So the first recollection I had was from June of 2018. Mm. Um, and uh, my files then show that in September of 2018, uh, we started developing our individual sections. Uh, I think at that point, the, the joint task force was a little bit backed up on different things. And then they provided a little bit of feedback. And then we started our, uh, as you recall, our, our weekly Wednesday night calls in December of 2019. And believe it or not, I'm sure you do believe it, <laughs> that went through October of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had basically almost two years of, of, of nightly calls with this. And during this process, the Joint Task Force was reviewing uh, sections as we were continuing to write. and. Eventually, we set a goal of having our first draft done by the February 2022 uh, Academy meeting. Uh, just before I assumed the presidency, I was like, okay, I want to get this off my plate. Uh, we made it, and I think uh, you do owe me uh, some drinks. Uh, my preference is Coke Zero, of course. Uh, and then uh, it went out for review. It was uh, revised, and then we had more calls and uh, had to respond to about 300 different separate comments from the reviewers and uh on, I'm, I'm delighted to say just just uh, a few weeks ago august 30th uh, a mere four years later it was accepted in in, in jackie so uh, uh I'm, I'm thrilled well uh, yeah i think i appreciate that behind the scenes look and as you stated i was part of uh, many of those calls and conversations but for our listeners 
that's four years from conception to publication uh, for this uh, practice parameter. So hopefully people can kind of keep that in mind as they read through all of the, the great information that's involved. Now, you were also previously a member of the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters, and uh, you've co-authored numerous practice parameters and clinical guidelines. I'm just curious, what keeps you coming back to the well time and again? I'm assuming there's some aspect of this arduous process that you enjoy or find rewarding. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, as, as you know, being on the Joint Task Force, uh, it's, uh, I think, a, a labor of love is a good way to describe it. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. It's probably one of the hardest working, you know, things that I've done within the academy, um, maybe aside from the president, but still, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. But at the same time, you really get the sense of you're, you're making meaningful uh, differences uh, for the specialty that we're really developing these uh, practice parameters and, and giving guidance for uh, clinicians. And I, I learn a ton doing it, um, and I think it's 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 hard work, but it's very needed work. And uh, again, the feedback that you hear uh, from uh, clinicians about, yeah, you know, the, the, we find these parameters very valuable in our clinical practice, and and that's so rewarding. Uh, so yeah, but after after a while, then it's like, well, I think it's time for some new blood. So after 15 <laughs> years, I was like, I think someone else needs to take over my chair. You get your, get your evening conference calls back again a little bit, at least. And I'm sure you moved on to other conference calls, but, um, you know, the last update in 2010 was more comprehensive. And why did the joint task force decide to go with a more focused parameter for this 2022 version? Yeah. So, um, we really looked at, uh, what was, what was really different um, and we didn't want to just uh, go through things and say, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of changes here um, because there are, uh, I think, several sections in the old parameter that really honestly haven't changed that much. So we identified areas that we thought had changed uh, pretty significantly and were worthy of, of doing an update. Um, <laughs> I, I, I honestly thought, that this was going to be, you know, a 10 to 15 page document, uh, and would, wouldn't really be that that difficult. Uh, how naive I was. <laughs> well, so this this uh, is not a 10 to 15 page document, and uh, it comes in at over 180 pages with close to 600 references. Uh, and boy, I mean, it sure seems to be as comprehensive as it gets when it comes to drug allergy, at least at at this you know current time. So, in full disclosure, and with no judgment whatsoever. Have you yourself read every single word in this document? So I, I, I have read the text. Uh, I promise you I've not read through all the 600 references. <laughs> so hopefully we've gotten all those right. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, as, as somebody involved in the editing process, I can attest that I have read every word at least three times. So uh, thank you for all of the reviewer comments and all the edits that we had to put together. And uh yeah, it's it's a it's a long one, but it's very helpful. And you know, along those lines, it's it'd be impossible for us to discuss the entire parameter during today's conversation. And I'm guessing that most people won't have the time or stamina to really, you know, sit down and read this in one sitting. In your opinion, what's the best way for a practicing clinician to utilize this resource? Yeah, you know, I think these parameters are not really meant to be read uh, you know, beginning to end. Um I know there are there are some people who who do that, um, but uh, I think a, a good way to tackle this one uh, would be to sort of start at the beginning because the way we kind of set this up is to really kind of highlight some of the the new things that are in this, and then the executive summary I think isn't like super long, and that really is uh, kind of the highlights page if you will uh, for the parameter. Um, and then obviously for those areas uh, that you find as a clinician that this is something that is a, a big part of my practice or I want it to be a bigger part of my practice, then you can certainly delve into that to your heart's content. Um, but I think kind of reading, getting getting a good sense of uh, what's, what's, what's in there and then coming back to it certainly when there are areas that uh, come up and it's like, well, you know, I was wondering about this uh, certain specific aspect it's always a good reference. 
Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's throughout not only this document, but uh, other practice parameters are these consensus based statements, which really they're, they're, they're in bold. Um, they usually precede the section, which then goes into more detail in regards to what, what those are. Uh, and these kind of, do, you know, are very carefully worded. And can you just describe what these consensus based statements are, how they're derived and how they should be interpreted by readers? Yeah, so uh, I'd be happy to do that, Dave. But in fact, as you know, you wrote the section on the consensus-based statement. So I thought this might be a good opportunity uh, for you to tell us what you wrote in, in, in the parameter. Uh, but yeah, I think this was a, 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 this was a departure from our old parameter, but it's certainly the, the wave of, of the future. And I think it was a good approach for this document. Um, so yeah, please. Take, a, take, take it away, Dave. Oh, my. The, the tables have been turned. Uh, so, no, this is... <laughs> so, I, I appreciate you asking me that. And here's what I take out of these. The, these consensus-based statements are, are evidence-based, and they are derived based upon a couple of things. Uh, the strength of the evidence that supports the statement and recommendation. Uh, and when there is a, a lack of evidence, that's also... Um, uh, discussed as well, and that goes into it. But the other key part of this is that these are, are recommendations, and it's really important, I think, for listeners to understand when you read a consensus-based statement, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's not, you know, you have to do this. It is in these situations, this is what is likely going to be beneficial for the majority of patients that would, you know, fit this description and also the preference of the majority of patients. But there are other things to consider, such as, you know, shared decision making and, and whether that applies to specific situations and things like that. So that's why you'll have um, both the strength of the evidence or the certainty of the evidence, as well as the strength of the recommendation. And a lot of these are more conditional recommendations because, you know, in medicine in general, there's very little that is purely black or white. So most most of these address more of the, the tones of gray. So how'd I do with that? Very well done. Very well done. Yeah. A, a, a plus. Yeah. So there, you know, for, for those who are us who are very close to this, um, we, we use wording very intentionally and a lot of times that may not be obvious, but uh, in these consensus based statements, when we say we recommend, uh, that's certainly like the strongest uh, recommendation, and we we find that that's the type of thing that yeah we feel like uh, this is what you know clinicians really should be doing in, in the majority of the time. Uh, the other circumstances are these more conditional recommendations where it's more of a suggestion, and we use the word we suggest. And there it's like yeah we think this is probably the right way to go, but you know there may be other things that. Uh, would go into that uh, decision making. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, th these parameters um, are, are really kind of guidance, uh, and and they're they're interpreted as guidelines. But there are certain factors that only you, as as the clinician, really knows um, and that may cause deviation from this. But we do think that there's certainly uh, changes that I think are as we'll get into that we think. Uh, uh, should that the majority of people really should be doing and, and approaching uh, certain aspects of drug allergy? <laughs> uh, you know, your your deep baritone voice is uh, well suited for podcasting, and I'm getting the sense that you kind of want this gig after your presidency is up. Is that what is it, is that what's going on here right now? Uh, absolutely not. I'm. Uh, <laughs> in, in fact, uh, last night I was telling my wife I said I was doing the podcast, and she's like, "Oh, I didn't know you did these," and so I played a few. <laughs> Uh, and she's like, those aren't very exciting. Um, so it's just like the podcast <laughs> I listen to have all sorts of music and things like that. And, you know, they're much more entertaining than you are. I said, well, Dr. Stukas is really good at these and he'll, 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 he'll get the best out of me. <laughs> well, you know, I appreciate the feedback from your wife. And if, if we want to, if she wants to make this into more of like a whodunit type of mystery podcast series, you know, we can explore those <laughs> options, I suppose. Uh, all right. So as we get into some of the meat of the parameters, and that's what we'll talk about for the last part of our, our podcast and our conversation today, can you offer some initial thoughts on how we should be classifying drug allergies and why this is important? This was specifically teased out at the at the beginning part of the parameters. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think this is still, um, this is honestly, I believe, still kind of a work in progress. Um not to say that we shouldn't be doing this, but uh, what's the best approach? Um, so kind of the way that we sort of talk about 
uh, classification of drug allergies. Uh, you can do it through a, a variety of different ways. You can think about the timing of, of the reaction. And, and in general, we think of drug reactions as being either immediate or delayed. And we say, well, an immediate reaction is within a few hours and delayed reactions are, you know, maybe six or more hours later. Um, and that helps us then understand what the potential mechanisms may be. Um, and as we know, there are a variety of different uh, potential mechanisms uh, involved with drug allergy, ranging from IgE-mediated reactions to T-cell-mediated reactions to pseudoallergic reactions that are due to MRG parx 2 receptors, et cetera. And then we also do spend a little bit of time thinking about just the clinical phenotype and what we may learn from that. You know, uh, is this just simple urticaria? Is it a uh, more biliform drug eruption? Uh, is it a well-defined uh, drug hypersensitivity reaction like SJSTEN or DRESS? So the, the more we kind of can uh, nail this down um, really helps us then in terms of the approach, uh, both in terms of, you know, diagnostically, management-wise, prognosis. So uh, I, I think all of these features really kind of need to, to, to go into kind of classification of a, of a drug allergy, but it's, it's not as neat, I would say, as ideally you'd, you'd, you'd like it to be. And I think there's, there's honestly still room for improvement in this, this aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as you said, it, you know, just starting the process of being a little more thoughtful um, in regards to just the term allergy can mean so many different things and uh, it can affect prognosis and risk and things like that. And the other thing I really liked was how the initial pages, as you mentioned, that, you know, there's a, a section on what's new and different, the uh, executive summary. And, you know, these parameters really spend a lot of space discussing a rather important paradigm shift in the evaluation and diagnosis of drug allergy, which sort of builds upon what you just mentioned in regards to thinking, being thoughtful about the classification of drug allergy. Can you discuss some of these critical areas and why such a focus was placed on this? Yeah, so um, I think right up front, we talk about uh, the, 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 the real big change, I would say, uh, stressed in this update compared to the previous uh, uh, drug allergy parameters. And that's really a de-emphasis on skin testing and more of an emphasis on doing challenges. Uh, so that's one thing, and we'll certainly kind of talk about that later, I'm sure. Um, and then we talk about this kind of concept about risk stratification. Um, and I would say simply put for a lot of things, especially like antibiotics, we really just kind of stratify, is this an anaphylactic reaction to an antibiotic or is it not? Um, and when you kind of simplify things like that, uh, it really does change the approach dramatically, uh, especially uh, as, as we get into kind of cross-reactivity between penicillin, cephalosporins, et cetera. And I'm, and I'm sure we'll kind of talk about that down the road as well. Yeah. And I was thinking as I put these, these questions together, you know, we sort of lived through with the... Um, reported reactions to COVID vaccines, which was occurring in real time as these drug allergy practice parameters were being put together. As you mentioned, this was a years long process. And it's sort of a microcosm of what the parameters address because there was so much skin testing early on, skin test, skin test, skin test, excipients and PEG and, uh, and things like that. And then the evidence eventually sort of showed that, you know, the skin testing is probably a very limited utility. Uh, and it's more about a risk assessment and classification of allergy. Uh, did you happen to, you know, notice that as well? I know you were involved in some of those those, those studies and writing along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I think at the, you know, we, we honestly, I think, um, made some mistakes <laughs> in, in our approach to COVID vaccination based, you know, because it's all, you know, guessing a lot about what mm. was going on with these, these reactions. Um, and, and, uh, frankly, I think our assumptions were honestly flat out wrong. Um, and now we know that the majority of people who have these immediate reactions to these vaccines can actually get the vaccines the second time and usually nothing happens. And that most uh, of these reactions tend to be uh, more uh, anxiety and, and kind of what we refer, is referred to as kind of these uh, immunization stress related responses versus any type of immunologic mediated reaction. So, um, 
it was something that I was always suspicious of, um, but uh, it took time for us to really kind of figure that out. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the, the, as everything COVID, it's a very steep learning curve. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, so it took us a, a bit of time to, to, to figure that out, but I think we're in a much better place of understanding that now. I think with drug allergy in general, we have for the, forever uh, accepted uh, skin testing as our reference standard for diagnosis of and confirmation of an allergy. And when we think about it as an allergist, why do we accept a positive skin test as the gold standard when we don't do that for virtually any other uh, allergic disease? I mean, if you just think about food allergy, we don't accept a positive skin test as saying that you're allergic to that food because we know there are loads of people who have positive skin tests of foods and it's clinically meaningless. Uh, So that's something that we uh, as a discipline really need to kind of take on and 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 not accept uh, skin testing uh, as our reference standard and that's why I think uh, drug challenges are really should be the reference just like they are with food challenges and uh, in, in, in food allergy uh, this is something that the field uh, needs to move uh, towards and I think uh, with our current parameter update uh, that's really the direction that we went with Along those lines, and I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, we've all been taught this, right? As you mentioned, it's just been, you know, forever as, as we all go through our training as allergists, immunologists, skin test, skin test, skin test. So do you anticipate barriers in clinical practice for those who are used to skin testing whenever possible? And if so, how do we help our colleagues understand the concepts surrounding risk stratification and then the use of these drug out, these drug challenges in their clinical practice? I, I do think it's going to be hard. Um, in fact, it, it, it was hard. It's been hard for myself. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh, thinking about you know penicillin skin testing, which we're just so used to, and we were like you know taught from infancy in our allergy fellowship that penicillin's the only drug that has validated skin testing. So why wouldn't you do it? Um, and now uh, we know that there are certain patients that really you probably don't need to do a penicillin skin test and you can evaluate through a, a direct challenge, especially in kids. Um, and this is something that it, it took me a long time to get more comfortable with um, for reasons that honestly don't make it. That, 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 honestly, I would say the biggest reason that I was uncomfortable moving forward with that was I, I don't tend to be be someone who really worries about getting sued a lot. Mm. Um, but on this aspect, for some reason, I was like, well, you know, if, if some, you know, adverse thing happens and then, you know, I'm on the stand, they're going to say, well, Dr. Khan, don't you know about penicillin skin testing and isn't that shown, et cetera. And, and tell, tell, tell us what, what those guidelines that you have your name on, what did that say about you know, <laughs> the approach to this? And, and then you'd say, well, I don't, I don't have a leg to stand on, right? So now that we have uh, these parameters that really then lend support and say, hey, uh, for the first time, we're saying that it is okay to test people without skin testing. I think that is huge. And I think mm-hmm. that gives that level of comfort saying that, I, you know, sure, there's a lot of evidence, but now we have a bona fide practice parameter saying that this is okay in these circumstances to approach it that way. So I think this should be a big um, uh, you know, stress reliever uh, that uh, this is okay to do. I think it's going to just, it's going to take time though, because these are, you know, muscle memory almost. <laughs> We're doing skin testing with all these people. And, and I think but the reality is, as, as you start to do it, the more you do it, and you find that, gosh, this is a lot easier. Uh, to you can delabel people people quicker. Um, it's it's I think uh, going to be a huge benefit for practitioners, and and a lot of things, a lot of uh, clini- uh, clinicians oftentimes complain about you know the cost of doing uh, drug allergy testing. I think this is. Uh, we know it actually reduces the cost, both the patient and also the provider. So I think this is a good thing. And along the lines of, you know, trying to do more challenges when clinically appropriate, 
Should we routinely be performing multiple day oral challenges for the evaluation of penicillin or other drug allergies? Uh, and if not, when should this be a consideration? Yeah, so this is something that uh, we do uh, actually have a, um, a recommendation against um, the, the use of these multi-day challenges. You know, the thought process was, well, you know, you have these patients who have these kind of delayed reactions, and you're only going to pick that up if you do a prolonged, you know, five or seven day challenge. And this is something that uh, in the, the European um, guidelines have, have recommended for quite some time. But there are now uh, are uh, several papers showing that uh, a single day challenge, uh, if you wait long enough, you can pick up these uh, delayed reactions. So there's really no need to prolong the antibiotic. And in the uh, you know, eyes of antimicrobial stewardship, we certainly want to avoid unnecessary you know, therapeutic courses of antibiotics when it's not necessary. So honestly, uh, I don't really, I, I, it's, it's hard to kind of come up with a time when you would uh, require you know, a five or seven day course of antibiotics when they don't need it as a challenge procedure to prove tolerance. I, I honestly don't think there's any role for that anymore. Hmm. And, and when you talk about single day challenges, are we talking about a one-time dose of the full strength of a treatment dose or should this be broken up into, you know, two steps or five steps or what, you know, what are some of the considerations for that? Yeah. So we, we talk about the, you know, the, the steps of challenges and things like that in the parameter. And one of the things that we're really kind of highlighting is that you don't need to do, you know, what, what is oftentimes referred to as a multi-step. Multi-step would be probably more than two. So a, 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 a one or two-step challenge is actually uh, appropriate in most circumstances. We honestly don't have any literature to say is doing two steps better than one, <laughs> but, but we know that e either way, uh, it, it, it gets the job done. Um, and, and essentially what we're talking about here, a two-step challenge for the most part is that you give approximately a tenth of the dose of uh, whatever uh, the therapeutic dose that you're uh, accomplishing. And then, you know, sometime later, maybe 30 minutes or an hour later or sometimes shorter, uh, you can give the full dose um, and then observe afterwards. So it's a pretty, it's a very straightforward way of, of doing that. And again, uh, what we're talking about is when we're doing these drug challenges, we're doing them in patients that have been stratified to be low risk where the pretest probability of them reacting is low. So we're not doing this in someone who had anaphylaxis, you know, six months ago and say, well, you know, let's, let's see if you are allergic by giving you this test dose. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about, oh yeah, my mom told me I was allergic to this antibiotic and uh, now I'm 50 years old. Uh, you know, what do you think? Mm -hmm. hey, you were uh, a guest on our podcast almost exactly a year ago uh, in episode 56, for those who are interested in listening. And that um, really focused on the importance of penicillin allergy delabeling. And this is also a point of emphasis in these parameters as well. Why was that included and what should clinicians be doing to help with this? Yeah, so we certainly, uh, in fact, that's one of our recommendations is this notion of doing proactive delabeling uh, of penicillin allergy when it's appropriate. And um, you know, I think most allergists now are aware that having that label of penicillin allergy is not benign. Uh, it, it's associated with a lot of adverse problems, not only for the patient, but also for the population at large. Uh, so it, 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 it's, it causes more increased costs. It increases the, the risk of patients staying in the hospital longer. There's even data showing that it increases mortality. And we know that very few patients who carry this label are actually allergic. Uh, so why not remove this harmful label? So uh, I think this is sort of the, the challenge that I would actually uh, throw down for uh, us as allergists and this concept of uh, addressing patients uh, who come into your office for other reasons. So you're, they come into you uh, for their uh, rhinitis or for their asthma or whatnot, 
and you happen to notice that they've got penicillin allergy on their label, that's a perfect opportunity to have that conversation about delabeling. <clears throat> and in fact, this is something that we've been doing in our own practice. And in fact, it's one of our uh, new metrics uh, in our clinic to make sure that we're actually doing this. And I've been impressed with this. Once you explain the downsides of carrying this label, how many patients will take you up on this? So I think it's, it's a, it's a, very worthwhile thing and and sometimes i see we, we get these referrals for patients that you know you're like i know i can't help this patient they shouldn't have been referred to me and then i'll find out that they've got a penicillin allergy label mm -hmm. and I'm like at least i can help with that and i feel better that they haven't wasted their time seeing me <laughs> uh I, I don't know if you've noticed this but over the last couple of years as we interview um applicants for uh, allergy immunology fellowship training programs. Um, and, you know, so these are typically third year residents. A lot of them, their quality improvement projects are focused around penicillin allergy delabeling, uh, which is amazing. And I think it's, it's, it's fantastic to see all these different residency programs across the country really focused on this. Have you noticed that as well? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, it's, 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 it's terrific. And I'm, I'm glad that this message is kind of, uh, filtering down and, and and that these uh you know these the, the future of our specialty is is, is is already getting involved in this even be, before they get into allergies so i think it's terrific yeah I, I agree with you i think that's a very interesting observation yeah you've sort of touched upon this already and this theme really permeates throughout the entire parameters in my opinion and i get the sense that many suspected drug allergies are not true allergies and clarification can occur through a standardized approach to taking a good history knowledge of pathophysiology and discussion of risk benefit with each patient is it really that simple and if so why does it seem so difficult <laughs> yeah the short is it honestly is that simple uh, <laughs> I recall one patient who um, uh, lived in, uh, uh, she came from San Antonio, which is about five hours from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, you know, it was a straightforward penicillin allergy. And um, she came and we gave, we, we, I think this was in the era where we didn't have any penicillin skin tests, but the, 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 the thing would be the same today. We, we literally just kind of gave her some amoxicillin in the office and she's like, well, that was pretty easy. Why couldn't my doctor have done that? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> so sometimes it honestly really is. And I think, you know, why, why does it seem so difficult? Um, I think we tend to overthink and over worry about drug allergy. Um, uh, and I think, you know, as, 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 as allergists, we, we learn about all the harmful things and we're always worried about anaphylaxis and, and, and whatnot. Um, but the, the reality is the vast majority of these patients really aren't allergic. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it's pretty easy doing this. I, I really do not lose sleep at all doing these type of, of procedures. Uh, in, in our clinic, you know, if I think about the, the you know, the, the reactions that, that I've seen in clinic, none of it's like, uh, none of the concerning ones are related to doing drug challenges or things like that. It's immunotherapy. But mm -hmm. we all do immunotherapy. We don't worry about that. Uh, hmm. So, uh, it, uh, you know, I, I've, I've literally given epinephrine once in a patient uh, for a drug challenge, whereas, you know, not, not that I'm giving epinephrine shots on a weekly basis in our clinic, but it's, you know, it's not uncommon to do it for our immunotherapy patients. So, yeah, I think it, it, it's the, the con I don't know why the framing is so different, but uh, we're, we're so comfortable giving immunotherapy, uh, yet, you know, the reactions that we do are so much more frequent and, and, and drug challenges in, in the appropriate patients. And this is what we're talking about, risk stratification. It, it's a walk in the park, honestly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and somebody who deals only with pediatric patients, whenever I work with our fellows in training, uh, I, I try to emphasize instead of assuming that their reported allergy is real, let's assume the opposite and let's make them earn the diagnosis. And by the standardized approach, we can sort of go through this and figure this out for them. And it, it can make a huge difference in their life moving forward. Absolutely. I like that. Earn the diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what guidance is offered in the parameters regarding the evaluation of suspected non-penicillin antibiotic allergies? Yeah, so um, 
we do talk about uh, some other really important things, um, namely uh, cephalosporins um, and, and sulfonamides. Um, so I'm really excited about what we said about sulfonamide allergy uh, because I think this will be a true game changer for allergists. So I think most allergists are very uncomfortable with testing patients who have a history of sulfonamide allergy. I think we're all, you know, because we, we, you know, sulfonamide antibiotics are bad actors. We know that they cause a lot of severe drug reactions. And, you know, we probably all have seen uh, patients who've had severe drug reactions to sulfonamides. Um, so I think that's the lens that we see these patients. But the reality is, you know, there's a lot of patients with, with you know, organ transplants, et cetera, that need sulfonamide antibiotics, uh, and it's 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 a it's a safe way to uh, for antimicrobial prophylaxis for these patients. Um, so the literature, is that, as we all know, is all about these kind of desensitization procedures, which is mostly based on HIV populations, and you know it's 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 all over the place. You know, you do you do a ten day procedure? Do you do a six hour one? And that was what was in the old uh, the 2010 parameter. Um, but when you actually look at the data, and, and we discussed this uh, uh, in, I wouldn't say gory detail, but in some detail <laughs> in the parameter, uh, that uh, it really, actually there's been a few studies that look at comparing just doing a challenge versus one of these desensitizations, and it doesn't really make any difference. Um, and now there are a few studies that have shown in largely non-HIV patients that doing a simple one step to a full strength, or in some cases a two step challenge with the, uh, you know, cotrimoxazole, Bactrim, uh, you can safely delabel patients. And again, it's the majority of patients that pass these these tests. So I think this is something that we will have to get, uh, uh, you know, accepted to, you know, get out of our comfort zone and say, hey, you know, this is something that we want to delabel. Now again, this is a little different than proactively labeling everybody who comes in with a sulfonamide uh, allergy. That's not what we're talking about. But when there's a need for it, um, it's something that we, we, we can do. And again, it, it's, it's a simple way of, 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 of doing this. Uh, regarding cephalosporins, the one thing I want to say is that, uh, again, as we've been taught in, in our infancy in medical school about the cross-reactivity between penicillin allergy and cephalosporins, and uh, we had these various, uh, you know, algorithms in our 2010 parameter about how to approach this. And now it's very, very simple. And basically, if you have a penicillin allergy and it is not anaphylaxis, which is, you know, probably 99% of the patients you see, uh, and they need a cephalosporin, guess what? They can get any cephalosporin they want. And it makes it as simple as that. You don't need to test them at all. Mm -hmm. Now, what about that rare patient who comes in with penicillin allergy, and it's, and, it's, and it's legitimate, it's an anaphylactic penicillin allergy? They can get a cephalosporin with a uh, disparate uh, side chain. So, for example, uh, they can get cephazolin preoperatively, and you don't need to test them. So this, I think, uh, will be critically important. We really need to get the message out, not to allergists so much, but to uh, hospitals and, and primary care, et cetera, so that they can treat patients more effectively. Um, not to say that we shouldn't be delabeling these patients. Maybe we can delabel them more uh, at a leisurely outpatient uh, basis, but it shouldn't interfere with their care in the hospital. So I'm really happy that we have these, uh, these recommendations in place. I've never heard somebody get so excited when talking about sulfonamides and cephalosporins, but that's why <laughs> that's why you're, you're the you're the right person for this conversation. <laughs> um, now, you know, rightfully so, antibiotics are a main focus of these parameters, but there are other types of medication discussed in detail as well. What are the main recommendations surrounding the evaluation of suspected aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease? Yeah, so um, I think the, the the big point I would say with AERD um, is that we really emphasize how good the history is in making a diagnosis. Um, and um, 
that, uh, you know, if you have a history of someone who ends up in the emergency room uh, because of, uh, you know, asthma after they've taken an NSAID and they've got nasal polyps, uh, you can be very confident that they have AERD. It's a one-time uh, story like that. So in reality, there's rarely a need to do any type of challenge uh, in these patients. And essentially that's what our recommendation is, is don't, you, you don't need to, to, to challenge these people if the history is good. Now there are some patients who, you know, have, who have asthma and they have nasal polyps and they've avoided NSAIDs you know, for the last 15 years. Oh, well, then that's a person that may need to do uh, some type of challenge procedure to figure that out. Um, I would say the other thing that's been a little bit updated is we've provided some additional protocols and discussions about desensitization procedures for our AERD patients. So there is a little bit more in there uh, uh, about that as well. What about other types of aspirin or NSAID-associated adverse reactions, such as patients who experience hives and swelling after taking these medications? Uh, do these parameters contain any major updates for these concerns? Yeah, we do. Um, so um, for a lot of, uh, you know, and, and again, I think um, one of the messages that we, we do talk about is the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, a lot of patients who carry these labels of NSAID allergies uh, don't, aren't really allergic as well. And so uh, one can uh, perform challenges. Um, and if you're, uh, for these patients who, come in with a, say, they get hives associated with ibuprofen, and maybe it's a one-time uh, episode. Uh, so the question is, is this someone who is only sensitive to ibuprofen, which there is a phenotype that it's very selective, or is it someone who's going to react with hives to any type of NSAID? And how do you approach those patients? And our recommendation here is, let's use aspirin to figure that out. Um, and why did we pick aspirin? We actually picked aspirin specifically because, um, you know, we, you know, there is very little evidence that aspirin causes true anaphylaxis. We do know that NSAIDs, NSAIDs properly, uh, can cause anaphylaxis rarely. Really not aspirin. So we thought this is a very safe way to determine tolerance to other NSAIDs. And so that's actually a recommendation that we have in the new update. Mm. A newer area uh, surrounds the evaluation of suspected reactions to specific chemotherapeutic agents and biologic treatments. How can these patients be risk stratified to then help guide testing, avoidance, or other approaches to re-administration of the offending agent? Yeah, so this was an area that we uh, did spend a lot of time uh, discussing what the right approach is. And, you know, if you look in the literature, uh, the literature is mainly talking about, well, uh, let, let's take, for example, platin-containing uh, chemotherapeutics that you can skin test for these platins, and there's evidence to say that, you know, this can actually help in your risk stratification and modification or, or management of these patients. But then we, when, when we kind of discussed this at a work group level, and in fact, uh, with the, within the, the joint task force as well, you know, how many uh, uh, allergists, immunologists are able to skin test for chemotherapeutics? Uh, even in our center, this is something that we don't do often at all because it's very difficult and challenging and there are regulations on who can uh, handle these skin test things, et cetera. So while the literature is all about using skin testing to guide management, what about you know the 99% the of the rest of the world where skin testing is really not a great option? Well, here now we say, okay, doesn't mean you can't do anything. In fact, you, you can manage patients. And depending on the chemotherapeutic that's used, depending on the reaction, we can risk stratify based on that information to determine whether, you know, maybe we want to slow the infusion, maybe we want to do a pre-medication, or maybe we want to what we refer to as an empiric desensitization for more severe reactions that we don't have confirmation that they're allergic based on skin testing, but the reaction was severe enough the drug was suggestive that this is likely IgE mediated, and you can desensitize these patients without ever doing any skin testing. So there are ways of approaching these patients 
even without skin testing, we thought that was important to put in the parameter. Mm, absolutely. And and we can direct our listeners to the full parameters for a more in-depth discussion of the specific chemotherapeutic and biologic agents. But are there any ones that you feel merit discussion here? Yeah, I think what we really kind of focused on were the the chemotherapeutics and biologics that as allergists, we tend to mm-hmm. see uh, reactions from the most. You know, as you know, there's a gazillion of them out there, but not all of them cause hypersensitivity reactions and don't really come across our doors. Um, so as I mentioned, kind of, we, we, we talk a lot about platins because platins, uh, there's very good evidence that these are IgE mediated reactions. And I would say that probably the, the most typical approach is to do a rapid drug desensitization. One of the things that we do discuss as an update is I think everyone's familiar with the three bag a rapid de, uh, drug desensitization that was really kind of honed and uh, refined by Mariana Cassells. Um, but it turns out that there's more evidence suggesting that a simple one bag, so you don't make any dilutions, you just use one bag that may get the job done as well. So I think that's an option for people just to make things even a little bit more straightforward. Now, in contrast, taxanes, which are, you know, this would be this, you know, right up there in terms of, of, of uh, referrals for chemotherapeutic reactions, these are typically not IgE mediated. And here for these more, more uh, less severe reactions, slowing the infusion or pre-medication is appropriate. And then for those patients who do need rapid drug desensitization, there's a pathway that if they do well, you may be able to transition them away from desensitization to just kind of a slowed infusion. So we talk about that. We have some algorithms in the parameter to discuss that. Uh, we also get into rituximab and how to approach that because that's a pretty common one that we, that uh, uh, comes across our plate as, as allergists. So we really kind of highlight the ones as allergists that you're more likely to, to encounter and how you can manage these patients. Mm-hmm. And as we kind of wrap up here, and we already talked about the the fascinating phenomenon of evaluating patients with suspected hypersensitivity reactions to their COVID vaccines, and how it really overlapped with you know some of the other uh, um, you know teaching basically going on in these practice parameters. And these practice parameters don't delve into the literature surrounding COVID vaccines necessarily because of the the timing of it and things like that. But there is some overlap in the section that's on excipients. And I would love for you just to take a, a moment to explain. What are excipients and what role do they play in drug allergy? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. <laughs> and as you kind of highlighted, um, no, nobody thought at all about excipients <laughs> prior to uh, the COVID vaccine in terms of like an allergy perspective. And suddenly excipients are, you know, at the front of everyone's minds uh, in terms of, you know, allergy. Um, so excipients are basically... Uh, things that are added to uh, pharmaceutical or, in some cases, food products and other things uh, to help stabilize, et cetera. Uh, they're, they're, they're not part of the active pharmacology of the drug, but they're essentially additives, if you will. Um, the main message that we stress in the parameter is that uh, excipient allergy is very rare, um, and I, I don't think that can be stressed enough. But you know, when should you think about excipient allergy? And that would be in patients who have uh, what I would call bona fide anaphylaxis. This is like legit anaphylaxis. And it's two two disparate drugs. So they're Mm. completely different. But there is a common thread here. And it's like, oh, yeah, they have the same excipient. That's someone you could think about. And the, the classic examples are injectable corticosteroids and then PEG-based laxatives. Um, so again, I don't think we need to be thinking about uh, excipient allergy all the time. Uh, in fact, I was real excited uh, that uh, I was going to have my first case of PEG uh, excipient <laughs> allergy in a woman who came to me who had legitimate anaphylaxis to a couple different products uh, that contained uh, the that contained PEG. I'm like, this is a great story. We tested her. She was not allergic to PEG. Turned out she had mastocytosis, so I'm still waiting mm-hmm. for my first uh, excipient allergy patient. <laughs> <laughs> um, where can our listeners find the the full published drug allergy a 2022 practice primer update? And are there any accompanying slides or other materials to help those of our colleagues who are interested in educating others about these updates? 
Yeah, so um, pretty soon uh, the uh, parameter should be available on Jackie in its kind of, uh, I would use maybe in quotations, its ugly form. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not too pretty. Uh, uh, we have not yet seen the galleys, but I, my anticipation was, would be probably in the next month or so, uh, hopefully the, the 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 full update will be in an all its glory and and, and Jackie uh, online. So we're we're excited about that. Um, and then in terms of the slides, um, you know, fortunately on this conversation we have uh, the person who put together the slides, uh, Dr. Stukas. So uh, and I, I can say uh, Dave did a terrific job putting together a slide set that. Uh, you know, how, how do you encompass uh, a slide set for such a large uh, parameter? I think he, he did a, a, a terrific, I should say he, you did a terrific job <laughs> <laughs> putting this together. Uh, so kudos to you, Dave. And uh, and a- honestly, you can maybe tell me because I'm not sure where, where to find those. Yeah, so they're going to be on the practice parameter website for sure. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure the Academy will have some link to them as well. And then for our listeners who may be catching this, you know, down the road in, you know, in, in December or January or whenever it may be, we will definitely put a link to the full drug allergy practice parameters on the web page where you access this podcast. So you can go to uh, the Academy's website uh, and look up the podcast and you'll get a direct link right to it. So there'll be multiple different ways to um, to find this information. And thank you very much for your kind words. I, I, I didn't plant that question to hear you say that, but <laughs> no, that, <laughs> but really the goal is, and you, you touched upon this and it's so important of, it's one thing for us as allergists, immunologists to read this and understand it and apply it to the patients that we see. But we all you know, firmly believe, especially on the joint task force, we want to spread the word. And I think that we want to give materials like this slide deck uh, to make it easy for anybody to give presentations to their, you know, their colleagues in the community or at your own institution and and things along those lines. So by all means, that's why they're there. Uh, Feel free to use them um, as you see fit. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, just yesterday I was giving a grand rounds to uh, uh, obstetricians and I threw in a bunch of our consensus based statements and uh, they were very appreciative. Yeah, right. Surgeons, obstetricians, uh, those in primary care, uh, pharmacists. I mean, there's, there's so many people that need to, to understand where the evidence lies right now and what these recommendations are. We, we've uh, covered a lot of ground with today's conversation, and I encourage anyone who's interested to really take your time and read through the parameters on your own. Um, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, uh, that's a great way to kind of doze off a little <laughs> bit as you as you try to tackle the behemoth, uh, you know, and you really and you can dive into some of the details on this. Do you think that we missed anything major during today's conversation, or is there anything else that we should discuss? Well, Dave, I've been meaning to mention to you as as, as joint task force liaison that we do need to start scheduling our weekly calls because we've got to start working on the update again already because you know, this is with this, a multi-year process so we better get started right no <laughs> no i think we've covered uh, a lot of uh, the, the key aspects uh in this um yeah the, the the real big things that i think um are are, are truly uh, practice changing um and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm again uh, real excited that this is finally seeing the light of day. It's it's it's, it's been a long process, but uh, I think uh, we're we're pretty proud of the the, the ultimate product. Well, uh, yeah, as we wrap up here, and I really can't thank you enough for taking the time to to spend with us and discuss all of these things. What's next for you? Uh, are you on to the next clinical guideline or, or practice parameter, or, or is your focus elsewhere now that you're about halfway through your your term as the academy president? Yeah, so uh, no no parameters in the future for me, hopefully for, for mm-hmm. a while. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, as you kind of mentioned, uh, uh, one of my uh, main focuses will be to get the word out about the parameter um, mm-hmm. and to every audience that uh, that uh, I mean, now, honestly, I think every medical audience is appropriate uh, for this. So um, I will actually be presenting. Uh, at my presidential pl- plenary uh, in San Antonio um, um, about the updated parameter. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Oh, that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was just thinking that I'm sure the the speaking invitations have gone out for the Academy annual meeting already. And I have no doubt that drug allergy will be on the on the docket this year. It will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Khan, this has been a very useful conversation. and I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Do you have any last words before we depart? 
Well, I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody that in 19 days, another important holiday is coming up, uh, National Penicillin Allergy Day. Um, and I, I thought I would share with you a kind of a interesting story uh, that, that relates to this. Uh, it's not, it'll, it'll sound like, where is he going with this? But there's a point <laughs> to it. Um, so uh, Kristen Alvarez is the pharmacist uh, who um, really kind of came up with our the, the great idea to have a pharmacist-led um, inpatient uh, penicillin allergy labeling program at our, at our county hospital, Parkland. Uh, and we've been doing this since 2014. It's been uh, terrific. So she had mentioned to me that she was getting some landscape lighting done at her house. And, uh, you know, she was like looking at the, the, the guy who was doing this. And, and, and the contractor's name was uh, Fleming. And she's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, you know, I, I know of a, a Fleming. And he's like, yeah, I, I'm related to that guy. So uh, there is uh, uh, a uh, Fleming has come to Dallas. So uh, now he's not doing spend someone <laughs> hours, but uh, I thought that was really uh, karma. <laughs> That's very cool. Uh, and then uh, September 28th is the day. Is that, is that the same date every year? Is it National Penicillin Allergy Awareness Day? It is, yeah. So you can set that as a reminder in your calendar uh, forever. Yeah. Are there parades? Are there floats that we should be looking for or uh, anything along those we, lines? We, are, we, we will work on that, but uh, the Academy is, is, is going to be doing a lot of different things uh, around uh, penicillin allergy day. So uh, stay tuned for more emails, et cetera. But uh, yeah, I think a, a parade may, may be in the works. Let's we'll think about this next year. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.